Okay, we'll read first Nectar of Devotion. Nana Shastra Vitari Nai Kanipano Satyadma Samstapaka Travitari nai kanipano Sadharma samsapaka my respectful obeisances to the six Goswamis, namely Srila Rupa Goswami, Srila Sanatan Goswami, Sri Raghunath Goswami, Sri Raghunath Bhatta Goswami, Sri Jiva Goswami, and Sri Gopal Bhatta Goswami, who are all very expert in scrutinizingly studying all the revealed scriptures with the aim of establishing eternal religious principles. Thus they are honored all over the three worlds and they are worth taking shelter of because they are absorbed in the mood of the gopis and are engaged in the transcendental loving service of Sri Sri Radha and Krishna. Okay, so we're reading Nectar of Devotion, Chapter 19, Devotional Service in Pure Love of God. Subheading, The Lord's Extraordinary Mercy. From the example of Chandrakanti as found in Padma Purana, 
and from the example of the gopis as found in Srimad Bhagavatam, it appears that a devotee who always thinks of Krishna and who always chants the glories or uh, uh, his glories in ecstatic love, regardless of his condition, will attain the highest perfection of unalloyed devotional love due to Lord Krishna's extraordinary mercy. This is confirmed in Srimad Bhagavatam. If a person worships, adores and loves him and loves Hari, the Supreme Lord, he should be understood to have finished all kinds of austerities, penances and similar processes for self-realization. On the other hand, if after undergoing all types of austerities, penances and mystic yoga practices, one does not develop such love for Hari, then all his performances are to be considered useless, a useless waste of time. If someone always sees Krishna inside and out, then it is to be understood that he has surpassed all austerities and penances for self-realization. And if, after executing all kinds of penances and austerities, one cannot always see Krishna inside and out, then he has executed his performances uselessly. Spontaneous attraction to Krishna, which is said to be due to the extraordinary mercy of the Lord can be placed under two headings. One is profound veneration for the greatness of the Lord and the other is one's being automatically attracted to Krishna without any extraneous considerations. In the Narad Pancharatra it is said that if on account of prof profound veneration for the greatness of the Supreme Lord, one attains a great affection and steady love for Him. One is certainly assured of attaining the four kinds of Vaishnava liberation, namely achieving the same bodily features of the Lord, achieving the same opulence as the Lord, dwelling on the planet where the Lord is residing and attaining eternal association with the Lord. The Vaishnava literature is completely different from the Mayavadi or the, the Vaishnava liberation is completely different from the Mayavadi liberation which is simply a matter of being merged into the effulgence of the Lord. In the Narada Pancharatra pure unalloyed devotional service is explained as being without any motive for personal benefit. If a devotee is, is continuously in love with Lord Krishna and his mind is always fixed upon Him, that devotional attitude will prove to be the only means of attracting the attention of the Lord. In other words, a Vaishnava who is incessantly thinking of the form of Lord Krishna is to be known as a pure Vaishnava. Generally, a devotee who has achieved the causeless mercy of the Lord on account of following the strict rules and regulations of devotional service becomes attracted by the supreme greatness of the Lord, by the transcendental beauty of the Lord and by the spontaneous execution of devotional service. To be more clear, by executing the regulative principles of devotional service, one can fully appreciate the transcendental beauty of the Lord. In any case, such exalted positions are possible only by the extraordinary mercy of the Lord upon the devotee. So tomorrow you can go on from the heading, Association with Pure Devotees.
ओम नमो भगवते वसुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वसुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वसुदेवाय नारायण नमस्कृत नर चरोतम दैवी सरस्वती व्यास तथो जय मुदीर नयेषु वद्रेशु नित्यम भागवत सगवती उत्तम श्लोक भक्तिर्भवती नैष्टकी वेर रीडिंग श्रीमद भागवता कैंटो थ्री चैप्टर नंबर ट्वेंटी थ्री एंड देवहूतिस लामेंटेशन दिस मॉर्निंग टेक्स नंबर ट्वेंटी फोर सतु सारिब्रति वासु वेणीभूत मूर्धन सतु सचकुवलक्षण सारिब्रति वासो विभूत मूर्धज सतु सचकुवलक्षण सारिब्रति वसो विभूत मूर्धज Mary. 
Is it Her husband, husband. Samadaya, accepting, accepting. Vacha, Vacha, the words, the words. Kuvalaya, Ikshana, Kuvalaya Ikshana, the lotus eyed, the lotus -eyed. Sarajam, Sarajam, dirty, dirty. Bibrati, Bibrati, wearing, wearing. Vasa, Vasa, clothing, clothing. Veni Bhutan. Matid, Matid. Cha, cha and, and. Murdajan hair. hair. Translation The lotus eyed Devahuti accepted the order of her husband. Because of her dirty dress and the locks of matted hair on her head, she did not look very attractive. You can repeat The lotus eyed Devahuti. Accepted the order of her husband because of her dirty dress and the locks of matted hair on her head. She did not look very attractive. Purport. It appears that Devahuti's hair had remained uncombed for many years and had become complicated in tangles. In other words, she neglected her bodily dress and comforts to engage in the service of her husband. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Nama Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupakada Mayam Dadati Swapadantikam Bandeham Shri Guru Shri Yatapada Kamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamsya Shri Rupam Sakrajatam Sahagana Raganathan Vitam Tam Sajevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakanitamscha He Krishna Karana Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Goranke Radhe Vrindavanishwari Vrishabhano Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakaupata Rubyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanibhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadhar, Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we're hearing how Devahuti and Kardama Muni are spending their married life. They've been living in the hermitage 
and Devahuti had come there from the palace of her father, Swayambhuva Manu, to live in the forest with her husband and to live a very simple, austere life, living on the banks of the Bindu Sarova and so taking their bath there, living on whatever was available in the forest, wild fruits and herbs and so on. So in this way she was performing great austerities. And uh, after some time, after it seems like years, she had been serving her husband because remember Satya Yuga, people lived a long time. So they were living for, he'd been doing his brahmacharya for several thousands of years and then He's entered into family life. Well, Devahuti came anyway to live with him. But it wasn't a big change in his life. He continued to practice his, you know, yoga and meditation and do his tapasya. And his wife accepted that lifestyle of her husband. She followed her husband. And the duty of the chaste wife is to follow the husband. Of course, not that if the husband goes to hell, you don't follow him to hell. Right? <laughs> the husband's a drunkard. It doesn't mean the wife follows him to become a drunkard. Or the wife said the husband's a drug addict, so the wife should also become a drug addict. No, there has to be some. The man should be properly qualified. Just like Kardama Muni, he was properly qualified. So the wife followed him. When the husband is qualified, then the husband will go back to Godhead. The wife follows her husband and she also goes back to Godhead. So this example, the relationship between the husband and wife is like between the spiritual master and the disciple. The husband is like the guru and the wife is like the disciple. And just as Devahuti is serving her husband, sacrificing her uh, physical appearance for the service of her husband, in the same way it's the duty of the faithful disciple to serve the spiritual master. All right? this, and this example is shown to us in Lord Krishna himself. When Lord Krishna was a young boy, he'd gone to live in the ashram of Sandipani Muni. Because after Krishna had killed Kamsa, then he released Vasudeva and Devaki from the prison house in Mathura. And then Vasudeva and Devaki, the next thing they did after being released from the prison house was they wanted to see that Krishna and Balaram should be educated. So they sent them to to school. <laughs> Even 5,000 years ago, you had to go to school. <laughs> of course, uh, schools were a little different then. And the school which Krishna and Balaram went to was also not ordinary. It was in the ashram of Sandipani Muni. And that was in Avantipur. Avantipur is today called Ujjain. And we have our ISKCON center there in Ujjain. If you go there to Ujjain, you'll see there's an ISKCON center. And they also have the ashram of Sandipani Muni, which was the Gurukula, where Krishna and Balaram had gone to study under Sandipani Muni. And you see in our temple in Ujjain, they have also one murti of Sandipani Muni. So, Krishna and Balaram were there and it's described in the 10th canto Srimad Bhagavatam how when Krishna was living there in the ashram on one occasion he had gone along with Sudama, Sudama the Brahmana. The two, the two of Krishna and Sudama were classmates and together they had gone into the forest to find wood because 
just like if you go to some temples today, they cook on wood. I was over in uh, Kulim last Sunday and the devotees there, some of the devotees there had told me they'd gone to Salem. They'd gone to Salem, to Bhaktivikasi Swami's ashram there. And they were telling me that they cook on wood. That all the cooking, there's no electricity, only oil lighting. And the cooking is all done on wood. Actually, even better than cooking on wood is to cook on gobar, to cook on cow dung. You get the best tasting food when you cook on cow dung. Wood is better than gas and electricity, but it's not as good as gobar. But anyway, they're, they're cooking on wood. So Krishna and Balaram, uh, Krishna and Sudama had gone to collect wood, not only for the cooking, but also for the yagya. Because every day in the Guruku, they do yagya, they keep the fire burning. We should also have a yagna stala here. Which, because when, the, just like yesterday, we were at that temple where they had Rathiyatra, I saw they had a yagya stala. Right? So regularly people come here, they want to do some function, they want some ritual, sometimes marriage and so, they, they have a yagya stala and they keep the fire going, you can keep it going every day, all the year. Just simply put more, feel, more wood on the fire. So if you have a lot of wood, you can do that. Like in Mayapur, in the Gurukula, they have a lot of wood there, so no problem to keep the fire burning. So Sudama and Krishna had gone there in the forest looking for firewood to bring back for the Guru, so they could do the yagya. But while they were in the forest, it happened there, there was a big storm, just like last night. In the night there was a big storm, right? Heavy rain. So the same way Krishna and Balaram were in the forest collecting the wood and then all of a sudden became very dark and the big clouds came and heavy, heavy rain. And Krishna and Sudama were in the forest. And after the rain stopped, they couldn't find their way back because their footprints, usually they would follow their footprints, but their footprints had all been washed away with the heavy rain. So they couldn't find their way back to the ashram of Sandipani Muni. So what happened? They had to spend the whole night in the forest. Not very pleasant thing to do. You stay in the forest all night, then, of course, what happens? The vultures come because the vultures, they sleep in the day. They eat at night, right? You go to Mayapur, when it comes to sunset, then you hear the vultures start to cry. You hear them, they start waking up. And so, it's a, the sign that the evening is coming, the sun is setting, the vultures start making their noise and moving around. They have to find their food. Sometimes they eat people also. Vultures are flesh-eating creatures. So uh, Krishna and Sudama were in the forest and they heard all these sounds the owl also, the owl also sleeps in the day, wakes up at night. So these the different birds and creatures like the vultures, and so, they're moving around in the night. Krishna and Sudama had to spend the whole night in the forest. The next morning, Sandipani Muni came from the Gurukul because Sandipani Muni realized Two of his students hadn't come home. Krishna and Sudama are missing. 
So the whole night they were been there in the forest and Sunday Panimuni came with all the other schoolboys because they're all coming to look. Where is Sudama and Krishna? What happened to them? Why didn't they come home last night? So they went to look for them and after some time they found Krishna and Sudama. They'd been there in the forest the whole night. So Sandipani Muni, when he met them, he embraced them and he told them that you have suffered so much on my behalf. I bless you that whatever knowledge you learn in the Gurukula, you will never forget. So this, this was recounted when Sudama had gone to Dwarka to meet Lord Krishna. He was remembering, or Krishna was remembering how the two of them together had gone in the forest to become stranded. So the example is very important because it shows the relationship between the, the disciple and the spiritual teacher. The, the, the stu it's the duty of the student to sacrifice bodily comforts for the service of the spiritual teacher. And just like regularly the devotees, we go out for book distribution. We go out to distribute literature on behalf of the spiritual teacher. We, go, we don't go out to collect money for ourselves, really. We go out to distribute the books, to give the knowledge, to share the knowledge with the people. And this is also distributing Srila Prabhupada's message. By reading the books, people become aware of Srila Prabhupada and his teachings and his mission. So it is as a sacrifice on behalf of the spiritual master. The same way the wife serves the husband in married life. The wife is the servant of the husband, just like the disciple serves the guru. So the wife Devahuti had been serving Kardama Muni and she would become very skinny and emaciated, so thin, very thin, because not eating any kind of opulent food, maybe no, no grains even, just living on fruits and herbs, bits of grass. So naturally she had become very thin. And it's mentioned here, she did not look very attractive. Now that's very important, that the wife wants to serve the husband, she, she should make herself look attractive for the service of the husband. Just like the disciple serving the spiritual master. The spiritual master wants to see the disciple bright-faced and happy and healthy. He should not look too thin, should not be too fat, should not be too thin. Sometimes Prabhupada would say, the fat one, right? He'd talk about one devotee, you see that? The fat one. So Prabhupada would notice that someone was too fat, he'd tell them, let them know. And if somebody looked too, th too thin and too sickly, he also did not like it. He liked to see the devotees were healthy, in good physical condition, and they should be bright-faced, and they should be clean and shining, or effulgent, right? Prabhupada liked to see this. The same way that this, the, the wife serves the husband, the wife has to always attract the husband, keep the husband feeling happy, feeling uh, satisfied in the association of his wife. So the disciples they have also the duty to the spiritual master in this way. So Devahuti, She's become so thin and 
she doesn't look attractive. And when her husband created the big mansion, she didn't feel herself qualified or worthy to go into the mansion. And her husband, Kardama Muni, could understand her thinking. So her husband tell, had told her to go into this Bindu Sarova, right? And when she enters into that Bindu Sarova, then she will be transformed. She will be rejuvenated, right? Rejuvenation. They have these uh, clinics everywhere. You know, they oh, come and be, have your skin rejuvenated, you know, uh, things like this, you know, they want to make people more physical, people like to be physically attractive. Of course, you become physically attractive, there's, there has, there's some purpose behind it, like Kardama Muni and Devahuti, Devahuti wants to have a child. Therefore, she should be physically attractive, right? Just like when people marry, you will see the wife always, the woman when she's married, she's always decorated, looking very attractive, you know. The face is all painted with gopi dots and flowers and things on their face, and the hands all decorated beautifully, you know. and. Oh, everything is, you know, looking very attractive. And that's how it should be for married life. There has to be that attraction. And then with the attraction, then they can produce the child. So Devahuti is not in this condition. She had been doing austerities. Her hair is all matted. And she's dressed in tree bark or ragged, ragged cloth. So, you know, how, can, how can her husband be attracted to her? So, he, he used his yoga powers to create the mansion. Now we're going to go on to hear how he uses more yoga powers to create or to restore the physical beauty of his wife, which is also very important for them, because they're going to enjoy, they're going to, they're going to produce children. So in order for that attraction to be there, he has to uh, make his wife appear uh, suitably. She, he, he has to tra rejuvenate her, make her skin very nice and her hair. We will hear in the next few verses, we will hear that when she enters the Bindu Sarova, there are many different damsels there inside the Bindu Sarova and they take care of her and they untangle her hair and they comb her hair and then they uh, put ointments and different things on her, uh, lotions are applied to her skin, and in this way increase her physical beauty, her bodily attraction. So this may appear to be maya, but actually they're pure devotees. They're in Krishna consciousness. You know, we have to understand that their situation, they're in family life and they want to produce children. Therefore, for this purpose, they have to make the proper arrangements. So, different ashrams have different duties. If they were vanaprastas, then that's not required so much, right? Vanaprastha life, retired life. You don't have to worry so much about these things, physical attraction. But in family life, in the Grihastha Ashram, it's very important. So for, for family life, there has to be also, a, there has to be some money, it has to be wealth. And so the government always encourage young people 
to enter into married life. Because when they enter into married life, then they have to think also to get money. And they have to work hard, you see. And so it's a big change for people. If people are single, they don't worry so much. But when they're married, then there's pressure, there's responsibility that they have the family to take care of. It's a big job. So they have to think how to generate income. They have to find jobs or make some business. They have to do some work, right? And then this, this is good for the economy. And so the, the governments, they always encourage people. They, they like people to enter into family life. They don't like people to retire. You know, they don't want you to retire. They, they, want, they don't want you to renounce. They don't like that very well. That's not very good for the economy. But if people are in family life, this is very good. Then they'll work hard, they'll make money, and they'll spend money. <laughs> they renounce people. They don't go out spending money, they don't go out to restaurants, they don't go out shopping and so on. Yeah, they're practicing renunciation. Their business is simply studying the scriptures and worshipping the deities. So, different lifestyle. So, Kardama Muni and Devahuti, they had been householders, but they hadn't really lived like householders because they had been very renounced. Kardama Muni had been practicing renunciation for a long time. And when his wife came, he didn't change very much. But he developed some relationship with her. And when she, want, when she requested him for the child, then he understood he has to make some adjustments in their living condition. And he arranges for this big aerial mansion, a mansion which can fly through space. And it's very luxurious. It's all diamonds and sapphires and wonderful gems, everything there for lighting the, the thing. But he also has to make arrangements for his wife because she has to have suitable clothing. Just like before a woman gets married, they will go shopping, right? They have to buy new clothes and new dresses. I remember in India, I used to go for life membership and we often used to go to the sari shops to get them to be life members. So sometimes a young woman would be in there, you know, and she's getting married and she's buying saris. And wow, she buys so many saris, you know. Because she's getting married, she has to have many saris, new saris. She'll change the sari every day. And yeah. Prabhupada said, average woman will not be happy unless she has at least 30 saris. <laughs> the man, a couple of pairs of trousers, you know. <laughs> For men it's a little different. Women are different. We have to understand different nature. So Kardama Muni, he has to understand the need of his wife. He has to make proper arrangements for not only, not only saris, but also they like to be beautiful because they have to attract the husband. So he has to make arrangements for her. For her because her hair has become all matted, her hair is all a mess. What can she do? Shave her head? Oh my goodness. That would not be very good, right? A wife with a shaved head? 
Uh, I had this one woman came off, so I was in China. This one woman came with a shaved head and she was telling me that my husband's always angry at me. I said, no wonder you shaved your head. <laughs> your husband's not going to like you to have a shaved head. Everybody laughed, everybody understood, you know. <laughs> Only she was so stupid, you know, <laughs> she shaved her head. Uh, so sometimes it's like that, you know, women, they don't know what to do. But Devahuti understands what to do. She was a good wife. She faithfully served her husband. And the husband's very satisfied with her. He wants to satisfy all her desires, all her needs, make arrangements. In the same way, it's the duty of the disciple to serve the spiritual master, to be engaged in service of the spiritual master. Brahmacharis should live in the temple. A brahmachari doesn't live at home with the mother and father. That's not brahmachari life. Brahmachari lives in the ashram. Prabhupada said even brahmacharis are supposed to travel with the sannyasis, go out for preaching and travel with the sannyasis. Brahmacharis don't live at home. If they're at home, they should get married. They need a wife. Because they have a... Of course, Lord Chaitanya had some concession. There was an example. Raghunath Bhatta Goswami was the son of Tapana Mishra. So Lord Chaitanya had gone to their home and he told Raghunath Bhatta, he told him, you stay here so long as your mother and father are in the world and take care of them. After they leave the world, then you come to Vrindavan. So like that, you have some responsibility to mother and father, you can stay with them so long as they're in the world. After they leave the world, then you go and live in the temple. You don't continue to live at home. Then somebody say, oh, my, somebody's telling me, my brother's a, a brahmachari, he lives, he lives alone. I said, that's not brahmachari, I said, that's bachelor. Bachelor means unmarried man. But it's not brahmachari. Brahmachari is ashram, spiritual ashram. We live in the spiritual ashram. Every day we have morning program, we have Mongo Arti, we wake up early. Every day we're together with the other brahmacharis. Association, very powerful, very important. You live at home, you don't have that. You don't, it's not the same. And similarly, Vanaprastas also should come and live in the temple. Otherwise you just, I don't know what, you're not ashram, you're just karmi. You live at home, no regulation, sometimes wake up early, sometimes not, sometimes read the books, sometimes not, sometimes do RT, sometimes not. You have to be in the temple, in the, in the ashram. This wonderful facility is built here to give the opportunity for all the devotees that they can come and be here. But how many people are staying here? Very less. There should be more people staying here, taking advantage to do the service, to take part in the programs. This is our duty as devotees to make proper use of the facilities provided by Śrīla Prabhupāda. Prabhupāda liked to see the temple full, not empty. We have big temple, we can fit many people here. And there are temples with many devotees. If you go to Australia, in Australia they have one farm, New Govardhan. I met a devotee from there, before he was living in Mayapur, he went back to Australia and he told me, he said, every morning 150 people for breakfast, 150 people. And many, they're all from different countries, not just Indian, 
Oh, so many Westerners, so many Aussies are there, all devo becoming devotees. And they have, of course, the woofer program. They have a lot of people come, they do voluntary work on the farm, stay for something. And they have different levels, you know, people becoming devotees, interested in becoming devotees. And this one devotee who I was speaking to, he told me he's teaching the Shastras to them, guiding, training them, educating them. All new people coming to Krishna consciousness and teaching also Bhakti Shastri. Chaga Chaitanya Prabhu told me also we want to start Bhakti Shastri in Malaysia. We want to do it here, give everybody the chance, try to encourage more people to study Prabhupada's books. So, so many things have to be done. But if nobody's coming to temple, if you have to find out where are they, oh, I don't know, oh, he's gone home, oh, he's... Uh, you. <laughs> we need people, or we need volunteers, we need manpower, very important. We have the building, we have the land, we have the property. Where is the manpower? Very important to get the manpower. We shouldn't be lacking manpower. In Prabhupada's time we had a lot of manpower. We didn't have property. We didn't have big buildings like this. But we had so many people. I had so many temples. I, I went to New York temple. We were sleeping all over the floor. Every floor was covered with bodies. You just had to find a space to lay down. That was how the temples were in the 1970s. They're full of people, so many devotees. So we want to try to encourage more and more people to take up active service in the Krishna Consciousness Movement. There's so much opportunity to make our life successful by doing service for Krishna. Okay, any question? Any question? Sometimes, uh, sometimes some dormitory uh, boys want to join. They've been discouraged by others. So, so what we should do? Well, they have to be convinced themselves that it's right to join. You know, nobody will, in when you're going to become a devotee, nobody will encourage you. So, so many, the mother and father won't encourage you, the friends won't encourage you, all the friends, all the people who are on doing all the, the smoking and the drinking and the meat eating and the drugs and all things, they won't encourage you, for sure. They'll say, oh no, don't go there, oh, don't go there, you'll never come out. They said to me, when I became a devotee, they said, oh, you'll never get out. They're right. <laughs> you, when you come in, you never go out. Huh? That's good. So people want to encourage you. You have to be convinced yourself, then only. But if people are convinced, then they will come. You can't expect people who always encourage you. Oh no, we encourage them. We encourage them. Come a devotee. We encourage them gradually, sometimes, something gradually. Sometimes they don't, if they give up too quickly, then sometimes then after some time then they regret. But anyway, no harm. They do some service, a little service is eternal benefit to them. Even if, even if they're, they're not successful, they made the attempt and that is glorious. That's always glorious because they made the attempt to become Krishna conscious. So we want to encourage that. Even the, it says, even they fall down, there's no loss or diminution. And a little advancement made saves them from the greatest danger. 
So show them the scriptures. What does Krishna say? Let them see. Them. Convince them on the basis of scripture. Let them come into Krishna consciousness. Do something for Krishna. Okay, Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Srila Prabhupada ki. Gaur Premanandi.